Hello, everyone. Thank you for checking out this special episode of Really Dicey. This is Manny. I'm here with Luke Gygax, creator and owner of Gary Khan, uh, writer. You've had your hands in role-playing games for a very, very long time. Uh, how are you, sir? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on uh, Really Dicey, Manny. I appreciate it. Uh, uh, yeah, you talk about my career. It's like, it's uh, essentially I've been born into uh, role-playing games. So my dad uh, was Gary Gygax, as many people probably know, and he was a co-creator of Dungeons and Dragons. So he created the game in 1973 uh, when I was three years old, and he published it just a few months later in the beginning, early, early months, uh, January of uh, 1974. So I've grown up playing not only role-playing games, but all sorts of games, uh, board games and card games and everything. Gaming was very important in my household. So uh, I've had people tell me I am patient zero uh, for role-playing games. <laughs> and, and, and if I may ask, because yeah, you're um, you've been involved since the very beginning of Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, do you feel do you feel that it's a it's a welcoming legacy? Do you feel trapped by it in any way? Oh, it's interesting because as a as a young person, well, as a child, of course, I was just very proud and you know of my dad because he was my dad, right? I think most kids are you know proud of their parents and, and love their parents very much. And then as you hit your teenage years, you kind of want to break out and make your own identity. And it was a little, a little strange having a father who was so well known. Uh, but uh, I, I joined the army at the age of 18 and I kind of found my own path through life. And I stayed in either the reserves or active duty all the way through 2022 uh, when I retired uh, from the army. So I had my own identity and that really helped me uh, be an individual. And my dad, I'm sure never wanted to he wasn't trying to stifle me. It's just, just one of those things as a kid or as a young person, I shouldn't say kid. Uh, I, I'm old now. So I say kid when I mean a, someone who's you know 18 to 20, you know, 22, 23, you really want to make your, your own identity and be known uh, uh, for, for, for who you are. Right. And the military allowed me to do that. And I, I felt uh, a lot of self actualization through that. Um, however, I really, am very, very proud and feel blessed to have the legacy that my father uh, uh, passed to me. I didn't appreciate how powerful role-playing games were until he passed away. I knew it was a great game and we had, we spent hundreds of hours, thousands of hours, I'm sure, together playing. And it was a, just a wonderful way to connect with my, my father. I've made friends just like everybody else, you know, guys I've known 30, 40 years. After he passed away, people started sharing their stories of what role playing meant to them and how it helped them through difficult times, whether it was a learning disability, a, a, a bad home life where they learned to not only escape, but to realize that they could uh, be powerful and that they could influence a storyline as a character. Well, that translates into real life. And there's some real life skills that you learn while playing, and the game changes you and I think makes you a better better person, more empathetic. It can teach you leadership skills and, and lots of other, other things like that. So having that legacy and realizing the impact uh, on the people who play as well as our culture has been significant to me. And I'm, I feel very, very blessed. Like your father, you're also a, a writer and a creator. Uh, Okram mm -hmm. is, is your setting. Yeah. If I may ask, um, when did you know that you were a writer? When did you know that, hey, I, I, can, I can make role-playing games and I'm enjoying it? It's an interesting question. So I started doing it, uh, you know, I would create with my father since I was just a boy. And I, what I didn't realize is that that just hanging out with my dad and spitballing stuff was really, I was learning the creative process <laughs> and, and how, how it's done. And I didn't really give myself credit until later on uh, when I realized, oh, this is just like what my dad was doing. I've experienced this plenty of times and I can certainly do this too. There's a bit of trepidation uh, because my dad was pretty good at writing adventures. Uh, you know, people, <laughs> I've heard people say, well, you know, his adventures were pretty tropey. Well, why are they tropey? Because they're so good. People copied them and they became tropes, right? I mean, that's, that's, that was, that's, that, that, that's why that happened. Uh, so there was a bit of trepidation when I first started writing. I was like, hmm, is it going to be good enough? But I think just like anything else, I'd had a little bit more experience that I gave myself credit for some of the early stuff I'm not as proud of, you know, anymore, uh, but you hone your craft and the only way to get better is by doing it. My, my dad taught me that. Uh, so I probably knew that I wanted to, to do this 
probably in 2013 or so. Uh, when I was still in the army, so I didn't have that much time. But I, it's when I first created the, my first adventure in the world of Oak Rim, and it started kind of taking shape in my mind. I said, you know, this is a lot of fun. And whenever I would travel or be places, I'd be walking with my wife or one of my daughters, and I'd say, oh, yeah, this. And I'd start kind of weaving a little story. This adventure would be like this. And, you know, the, you know, I was in Hawaii by the you know volcano or whatever, and just kind of spinning out some ideas of, of what would go. I wish I'd recorded them because as I'm kind of walking along, there were some great ideas, which have since fled my mind. Uh, but I guess my gears are, are pretty much turning like that when I'm in a creative, uh, creative space. Uh, so, so I guess for, I guess it's when Pinta, just by about 10 years or so, I realized, I think this is my second career. This is what I want to do when I retire. And so with, with Volkram, how did you know, like, how'd you feel like, okay, this is, this is the setting I want to work on. What, what is it about this idea that kind of sucked you in? So I wrote my first adventure in 2013 or it was published in 2013. So it might've been 2012 when I wrote it. Uh, and that was, um, Oh, what the heck was it? <laughs> a search for Darwas Temple is what it was. And it was a Gary Khan module in two parts. There's a tournament module. And I was working with Jim Ward to create one. And he's like, okay, well, let's outline it. And I was just trying to think of, you know, what would be fun? This is prior to fifth edition. So D D was not as popular as it is now by any stretch of the imagination. And uh, most players were seasoned players, and most were playing either third edition, Pathfinder or AD&D still, right? That, those were kind of the sweet spots. They'd both been around for a long time. And so uh, wonderment, a sense of wonderment was important to me. And I was thinking, hmm, I'm writing with Jim Ward, but this is fantasy. So why don't I just make an ancient civilization that was, uh, you know, had command of elemental magic so much so that they basically could create a world that had many of the conveniences of the modern world today, right? But they destroyed themselves. Well, how did they destroy themselves? I thought, Gamma World. There was a magical, essentially magical nuclear war that ravaged the land. This once, once lush and verdant planet was turned into a desolate place, right? The blighted lands. Uh, and so that was kind of the idea that went with it. Why was I thinking of deserty and, and hot and horrible places? Well, I'd just gotten back from a tour in Iraq, and that was fresh in my mind. It is no fun wearing body armor and being like 120 plus uh, degree heat. Um, and I thought, hmm, you know, players are like, yeah, my, my, uh, you know, fighters and plate mail and they're uh, running up this hill with their backpack and all that stuff. I was like, no way. No, you're not. <laughs> so I wanted to make some environmental challenges and I wanted a way to take even standard creatures and make them unknown and increase that sense of tension and wonderment in the game by reskinning them or blending monsters together through the chaos magic that flows in the blighted land. So um, that was kind of the idea of Okram. And then in the Gygax tradition, I took a name and reversed it. And that was my inspiration. So my wife is Moroccan. And so if you look at Okram and you backwards, it's a lot like Morocco. So, uh, and I also kind of has a, uh, a bit of a Eastern, Middle Eastern vibe to it, the Bosphorus area, a mixing of cultures, uh, which I thought would be a lot of fun. And then the main city, when, the city that uh, still stands in the world of Okram, uh, of the, from the Idrissid Empire, is the city of Shintufi. And Shintufi is uh, my uh, mother-in-law's name. <laughs> it's her maiden name is Shintufi. So that's where I took that from. And my wife has kind of helped me come up with a lot of the words uh, by giving me, you know, you know, what is it in rock and Arabic and, and these sorts of things. And we've delved into some of the mythologies there. And so she's kind of been a, uh, a sounding board and advisor to me, uh, for many things in the world of Okram. So, uh, that helped me kind of give it a nice, a nice flavor. So today we're going to talk about Wrath of the Sea Lich. Oh yeah. Is Korea Kickstarter. This is not a, a new work. This is a work that's been converted to Shadow Dark. If I, am I correct? That is correct. Yeah. So, um, Shadow Dark really hit hard last year uh you know uh, kelsey's been working on shadow kelsey dion is the creator of shadow dark she comes to gary Khan for many many years uh as just an attendee and she still buys a badge <laughs> when she comes to gary Khan, even though she's well-known uh, designer now uh such a great and humble person but she really shaped shadow dark the system 
over two, three years at GaryCon, put a lot of work into it. When the Kickstarter went, it really hit hard. It was it was going uh, it was going great guns, and I picked up and I read the you know the starter rules to it. I was like, man, this is pretty good. And so I talked to Kelsey and uh, I recruited her to work on another project of mine to celebrate the 50th anniversary. And and she's amazing. And I said, you know, I really like Shadow Dark. I want to do something and I want to do it quickly. Uh, so I talked to uh, my friend and and uh, partner in a lot of stuff that I do at Gaxworks. Um, Matt Everhart, who's co-author of uh, the Aya Shantufi series, the Shantufi series uh, that we wrote in fifth edition. And I said, you know, these are, I'm pretty, I'm proud of these adventures. I, I really like them. What do you think if we put them together into just one volume to be a big Shadow Dark adventure? And he's like, yeah, let's, let's do it. And so uh, I reached out to Kelsey and, and uh, obviously she was like very excited. She said, yes, that's awesome. And I said, would you be able to advise me on this and kind of kind of help out? And she said, I would love to. However, I'm swamped with stuff and I get it. She's a, uh, you know, small business, small business person. And she's, you know, her, her main focus is on making the arcane library thrive and strong. And, and, and so I said, okay, I understand you don't have the time to do it. Do you have any recommendations? And so she pointed me to a gentleman uh, who goes by Sursa Victory. And uh, he has a lot of experience in Shadow Dark. And he helped Matt and I take the storyline and convert it and kind of reimagine it into something that fits Shadow Dark a lot more. So uh, the styles between 5e and Shadow Dark are quite different. 5e, there's a lot of uh, perception checks and persuasion or intimidation and arcana checks. So there's a lot of surrounding skill checks that go into it that can, you know, there's a lot of investigation in this in the storyline, right? Um, whereas in Shadow Dark, really, the, uh, the DM uh, will basically give you if the players say well i'm gonna go and talk to this person i'm gonna ask about these things they may role play that but there's not really a die roll per se if they ask the right questions or look in the right areas you generally give them the information and carry the story along to the focus area which tends to be delving uh, generally underground into that combat uh, more of a, a, a tense combat uh, situation or dungeon delving uh so we Fortunately, we were able to find some a really good uh, fit uh, that where we could do this, and it changed the adventure around a bit. And I, 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 I might like it. I might like it better than the original version. <laughs> if I'm being, it works really well. Uh, and in the Shadow Shadow Dark, if you haven't played Shadow Dark, uh, grab the rule, grab the starter rules, um, and read it. It's fast, fun, and uh, really intuitive. It uses D twenty. Um, the rules are, if there's more than a page of rules on something, I, I'm shocked. I mean, it's going to be very, very few things. Very digestible, intuitive. The, it's focused on fun and excitement in the dungeon delve. One of the neat, um, one of the neat characteristics about the game or, or, or inventions with this game is uh, a time mechanism. So the name Shadow Dark implies that light and darkness are important in this game because you're underground. Nobody, none of the players, have night vision. You can't see in the dark. Only monsters can see in the dark. And the monsters love the dark. So they uh, thrive if your light goes out. Your torch lasts one hour of real time. So the DM is just going to start their clock when you got your torch going, right? And if you don't light another torch, if you're in a situation where you can't or you simply forget, it will extinguish. And then the chances of wandering monsters goes up, your ability to fight goes down, trying to light a torch can be difficult. So it's one of those mechanisms. Also encumbrance, essentially you can only carry so many items, right? So carrying a whole bunch of torches doesn't make sense. Um, so, you know, take a, take a peek at it, but it really appealed to me. It really harkened back to that core, uh, you know, kind of late seventies uh, feel of, uh, uh, of the adventure, but with smooth, mechanics uh that that are that are easy fast and fun uh so if you like that style do that and this adventure is going to carry you through this is three modules that we're putting into into one uh, a5 style uh hardbound book uh, just like shadow dark it'll probably be 150 175 pages uh, all new art um shadow dark uh uses uh it's, it's black and white uh art that really evokes for me uh it evokes 
a lot of imagination. There's a lot more that I can read into. Uh, some of the modern artwork uh, that that's in a lot of uh, of games is gorgeous and beautiful, and I, I lo- like I love the covers <laughs> of of the ones that are displayed right now. Um, and that's uh, Michael Syragos did all three of those covers. A wonderful Greek uh, artist, so uh, Michael not hit a home run in all these. And you can see they're they're kind of themed and in, in you know chromatic. So he's they're great. Um, but a lot of art, when it's full color, full detail, it doesn't allow your imagination to really fill in some of the blanks. I like that old Advanced Dungeons and Dragons monster manual style, where David Trampier or Sutherland or some of those guys. Uh, you know, had the art in there, Errol Otis, and you would see it and you got the idea, but there was still enough left to the imagination that your mind would fill in those blanks and you'd come up with something that really, you know, made it feel more your own or you'd got kind of drawn into that. So Shadow Dark evokes that same uh, sense in, in, in my heart. And so that's why I sort of fell in love with this style. Uh, but I'm rambling on now. I'm really going because I'm I'm very excited about it. I love this module. I love this adventure, and uh, I, I think you. I think I think people will love it too. So I'm just eager to get it into people's hands and let them play. So th- just to be clear, so the three the three models I have here, mm-hmm. and I think I interviewed you about one of them in the past. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So those three are being converted to this one book for Shadow Dark. That's correct. It'll be it'll be a it'll be a pretty like I said it'll be a thick tome. It, it, if it's less than 150 pages, I would be shocked. I, I'm guessing it's 175. We haven't laid it out yet. Uh, we're still doing a couple play tests in Shadow Dark to make sure that we got it right. I have like two, three uh, teams doing that. We're gonna have uh, like Brian, Brian CP Steele is gonna come in and and kind of just go over it from top to bottom again uh, to take a look at it because we've added some stuff. Uh, and uh, he's I've wanted to work with him for a while, so I just I brought him in to do some work. And my buddy. Uh, uh, my buddy Mike Merles is going to help me look at a couple classes, new classes that we're doing. So, uh, um, so I got some good eyes on this one. But I think it's mostly because all these guys also like Shadow Dark. That they're like, yeah, yeah, I, uh, <laughs> yeah, sure, I can do this thing for you. I can, I can help you out. Uh, but yeah, it's all three of these modules. Uh, it, it is a campaign, really, uh, that will carry. So, so Shadow Dark, just like original D and D, was kind of up to tenth level. That was like kind of the you know, you're going to retire after that. Like you've maxed out your, your big dog at 10th level. Uh, so this one, if you're playing with a group of probably five people, I would say start at third level and it will probably carry you to fifth. Uh, if you're you know, five or six people at third level, if it's like four people, you might want to be fourth level. And I think it'll get you up to maybe sixth by the last, by the last module and experiences, you know, uh, obviously it's simple, but, uh, you, you basically get it for, you know, uh, stuff, treasure and carousing and things like that. So it's, it's a really neat system. I, I don't want to get too much into the talking about the rules of Shadow Dark, but it's worth taking a look at. So uh, Wrath of the Sea Lich. Now, yeah. I'm going to ask you a question about it, and I'm a little afraid to ask you. And the reason why I'm afraid to ask you is because only so far you and Keith Baker, um, okay. uh, your understanding of your own lore is amazing. Yeah. Usually, so... You, not to discredit or say anything about other people I've interviewed about sure. adventure and stuff, but usually when someone makes an adventure, it's usually like a, you know, um, I'm a hero. Uh, there's a dungeon. I'm going to investigate the, jun- the, the dungeon, get the treasure, and leave. And usually, and that's fine. You know, that's 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 the 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 fun of D and D and similar systems. Yeah. Um, but when um, I remember last time when I talked to you about Okaram, uh, you gave me so much information about the the religion and the cultures yeah. and uh, governments of the area i was i was amazed at or, how or much intri- it, intrigued hopefully but yeah yes 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 of, of this it was just so much you gave me so much great information like wow this is a fascinating world um so i, I tried my best to read more about okaram before for this interview so so yeah. i can understand mm-hmm. what you've built here um yeah. and, and but and that's that's gotten a little bit easier i just want to say it's gotten a little bit easier because it exists all up here right and that's great, but I haven't had the time. It takes a lot of time to translate all this to be digestible by a third party, right? Who isn't sitting down and talking to you and you can't, you know, kind of give them a download. Uh, and so I realized if I'm waiting for me to do it all, all on my own, it's going to be never, <laughs> or I'll be 75 or something like that. And we need to get this into people's hands. So I've been fortunate and I've brought in a few people, Rob Howell and a couple, uh, a couple of his associates who um, have gamed with me. 
and understand and are, are, have read up on it. And through our Patreon, we're building up and fleshing out a lot of my notes. And we have a whole, like, gosh, I don't know, 200 pages, I would guess, mm -hmm. on on the Pantheon, all the gods and religious rites and that sort of stuff for, for Ochre Malone. But, you know, uh, uh, location descriptions and, and monsters and uh, magic items. So we're building all that out for a setting book that at a minimum will be 256 pages. It might be a little bit longer in 2025. And that's really coming together. So, but I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Oh, and if you want to read up on it, a great place to go is our Patreon, which is uh, gaxworks.com or patreon, patreon.com slash gaxworks, G-A-X-X-W-O-R-X. <laughs> well, you, you answered my next question. I was going to ask yeah. if, if you're going to make a setting book because there's there is yeah. there, there is so much information. So I guess my next question should be for anyone listening, hearing about this for the first time, I'm wondering what what are we talking about? Um, that what, look, particularly with Wrath of the Sea Lich, what mm -hmm. is going on here exactly? Sure. Yeah. So uh, Wrath of the Sea Lich starts kind of uh, as most adventures do. Well, this one we actually we, it, it starts with the there's kind of a fast start. Uh, so you're going to jump right into the action. You're going to be in the middle of an adventure and you're having to escape uh, uh, from a giant centipede in some undead creatures while you're out uh, digging around underground to get some treasure for someone who commissioned you to go get a, a gold, a gold idol, right? A gold statue. So that just kind of jumps you right into the action and kind of, kind of gets you going sort of like uh, an Indiana Jones movie. You know, you got some action up front. Uh, but then you're recovering from that and uh, you're approached by uh, someone named Pelicos Red in a tavern, right? It's a classic, classic beginning. You're approached by somebody who needs something in the tavern and, and uh, you are essentially treasure seekers, right? You're, you're, you're guns for hire who will go out and, and find these things and then get paid for it. Uh, and he needs your help. Yeah, I'm from out of town. I don't know where this is. It's somewhere in the city. Maybe you can help me out. And that begins your adventure. You're looking for something he calls the Oculus of Senra Ba. Well, without I don't want to give too much away of, of the story, but um, it's more than more than there's more to it than, than than what he says. And this Oculus, this Oculus is a powerful artifact uh, that's associated with the water element. And again, if you remember, the world of Okrim has suffered uh, essentially a magical nuclear war, great cataclysm, and so water, fresh water, potable water, and greenery is difficult now. The city of Shantufi has over a million souls. So how are they supporting that? Well, there's some sort of water aquifer or there's a water source there. So uh, you can probably figure that out. So uh, the sea lich is someone that you'll meet in the third adventure. Uh, so her hand is kind of weaving through this story unbeknownst uh, for the first couple parts. Uh, but essentially she's an ancient Idrisid uh, archmage who um basically doesn't want to give up on her civilization she realized her civilization was doomed due to uh, uh the fighting between two factions right uh but she basically did uh, the wrath of the sea lich there. she became a lich in order to basically live long enough to to wait through this time of turmoil and come back and try to bring back her civilization and turn back the clock in a way and i don't really don't want to give more away than that but arishkigal is pretty crazy after thousands of years of waiting for this and so uh the party the players uh have some choices to make uh, but essentially they need to stop uh, her from getting a hold of this thing if they want to save the million people who live in the city of shantufi and potentially tens or hundreds of millions more on the entire planet because of her uh if, if she's able to carry out her ultimate goals uh, it would change a whole timeline and uh, uh, create all sorts of havoc. So a uh, little bit of shades of uh, the Marvel movie with Thanos. Um, what was that? I forgot. What, how can I forget that? One? It's, a, it's a great movie. Oh, uh, uh, Avengers, um, uh, fin Infinity Wars. Infinity Wars. So a bit of Infinity Wars in there, too. So she's a little Thanos-like uh, in that sense. Uh, so I think someone pointed that out. I was like, oh, yeah, that's a good, that's a good reference. So it's a, a little Thanos-like in, in that sense. So she's looking to use these artifacts that are out there and gather them so that she can turn the dial back and change the way things unfolded. See, that, that's a really fascinating story. I love the idea of a, of a villain that were once a good guy. Someone that, uh, what's that saying? Um, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Good intentions yeah, thing. absolutely. You know? yeah, I find those, I find those characters very interesting, uh, uh, because it is easy. It is easy for various reasons 
to become compromised and uh, to put your morals to the side or, I mean, I hate to bring up politics, but I think we can see that in, in real life where you can, someone enters in with nothing but the best of intentions, but in order to achieve their goals, well, you know, I need resources, I need money, I need whatever it is. And in order to get this thing so I can do this good thing that I want, well, okay, I have to compromise and, and help this other cause that maybe I'm not a supporter of, or maybe he's even a little antithetical to what I, but the ends justify the means. And before you know it, you've, you've, you're totally off course, right? And that, that realization, uh oh, maybe I've become the big bad guy, you know, the big bad evil guy. Uh, so that, that's interesting. That's an interesting storyline for me. Yeah. Yeah. The, the idea, even, even, um, like business, you know, like, hey, I want to be, succeed in business, but at what cost? Do I take out my competition? Do I make them unemployed in order for me to become more rich? Things like that, you know. So storylines like 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 this is really interesting. And you, it looks sounds like you also have like like so yeah. Again, this is this is so many interesting complications you have in this in in a wrath of the sea glitch. You have like rivals that are trying yeah. to compete against you to get the uh, the the magic items and and. And and for for free to um, correct me if I'm wrong, but the the idea of a sea lich it, is this going to be like an underwater adventure? Well, uh, there is an element there. There is a part of it that that takes you under that takes you underground. So or underwater, yes. So that's that's uh, in the third part uh, of the story. You essentially Arishkagal has gotten a hold of the Oculus and has come out of stasis. Um, again, without re revealing too much, there was, there, there, there's a lot going on there, but essentially her, her fortress, her underground layer is waking up and you're drawn, you figure it out, you get clues, you're, you, you, you end up there and you need to intervene in order to, to get her off, off course. And if you don't, it's going to be a very, very, uh, difficult time. Uh, for, for the world if she gets a hold of that thing because uh you know she's extremely powerful and the only way the party can really take her out or uh drive her off is because she's in a weakened state right so you gotta strike swiftly and do and do the things uh correct in order to overcome uh, a superior foe and isn't that a heroic story right mm. but that's that you know heroes you're in a desperate situation you're hopelessly outmatched but you have these certain things in your favor and you gotta you know Give it the old, give it, give it the, uh, you know, college try. You're, you know, you're Luke Skywalker. You're going into the trench. You know, you got one shot on the, on this thing in the Death Star uh, to be able to take it out. You know, and that's, that's a great story. Mm. So it sounds like this has um, not just your typical dungeon delve. It's there's, there's layers of plot, layers right. of um, uh, role playing involved. Yes. Um, um, do, do you, would there be, uh, I guess, um, uh, do you plan to have like, like new magic items, new, uh, oh yeah, best year things like that. Sure, we've already. Uh, so there'll be add-ons. Uh, so the campaign's got like another ten or ten or eleven days to go from from the time we're we're shooting here. So it's it's in the last third. Uh, we're fully funded and we're working on stretch goals. So, uh, gosh, at the thirty thousand uh, goal, I'm added added two new classes that are Okram specific uh, to Shadow Dark. So there'll be the Luminary, which is uh, a, a holy a holy warrior who's dedicated to the goddess Bushira, the goddess of light, knowledge, uh, uh, you know, sunlight. And, and, uh, uh, she does not like undead. So, uh, uh there'll be a luminary and, uh, obviously <clears throat> kind of a little paladin esque. Uh, and I'm working to make that a, some, some of the attributes and some of the things that it can do, uh, to be balanced with the game. And then I'm going to introduce the blighted magus, which, uh, is, uh, someone who, kind of has a little a little uh devil or demon demon heritage uh in them as well so they have a little bit of natural spell casting ability they tend to be aligned towards chaos uh and uh you know the 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 bad parts of the ancient idrissid uh uh magics in, in in there and they can also do a little bit of fighting and, and summoning of dark summonings and things like that so two kind of characters that uh two classes i should say uh that can be played uh we're gonna i think up next we have five one page adventure starters. Uh, so if you wanted to have a campaign in the world of Oak Rim around the city of Shantufi, we'll have five one page adventures where you could take your players from that first level and get them up to third level so that they can start the Wrath of the Sea Lich storyline, right? So that might be a fun way to, if you're new to Shadow Dark, 
um, which I realize some people may be. You may have even picked up the rules and just uh, uh, don't know. And in fact, I think I may dip back in and and uh, add a pledge level so that people can get the rules and Wrath of the Sea Lich together. So it's a little late in the game to do that, but I'll I, I talked to Kelsey and she was she was she was happy to partner with with me to do that. Obviously, she'd like more people to play Shadow Dark, right? Because uh, uh, and it's a great game, and I'm I'm a uh, I'm a cheerleader for for Shadow Dark. Um, but yeah, it's 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 great. Uh, I think we have some. If we can make it up to forty thousand, I think we unlock uh, five maps from Dyson Logos uh, that'll be going there, and then I think I have two more classes that I'm uh, kind of in development on. That we could add that are okram specific and for our add-ons um we'll have some pdfs with uh the gods of okram magic and spells uh creatures uh as well as some other of my adventures and things like that that uh, folks can can pick up as well so uh check it i mean really go there and if you're looking to do some shadow dark if you want to start a shadow dark uh campaign uh with your or even to test run with your group uh this would be a great way to do it you you pick up uh wrath of the wrath of the sea lich and the the five one pagers and i think you've got several several months of of gameplay with your group if we, we could share a little bit more about the the maps in this game mm -hmm. how um drawn out is this adventure sure so there's a there's a couple there's an area map of the kind of the central coast of of shintufi to kind of give you some orientation in case you just wanted to run a little adventure on your own you'll make something up you know for your people to go off and, and do something as a little you know offshoot uh, and then there'll be an over uh, an overhead one pager of the city of Shintufi, kind of again more for orientation. And then the under where the underground is where a lot of the you know, adventuring takes place. So uh, there's several maps that that uh, you know it, if if you're going underground to do something or adventure and there's monsters, there'll be a a classic looking black and white grid map. Uh, with you know numbers on it and, and a key and that sort of thing, so it's in that sense that's all all spelled out. Uh, as I think in a fairly standard way, um, and we have the maps done obviously already. It's just I asked Dyson, hey, if we get to this point, would you make some beautiful maps for us? Because Alyssa Alyssa Fadden did the maps for me of of uh, of uh, the city of uh, Shintufi and the Central Coast, and she's extremely talented what an amazing amazing cartographer and then i know dyson uh is 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 quite popular as well and has a lot of a lot of skills so i just wanted to i just wanted to have his maps <laughs> in my in my adventure so uh, sometimes that's that's just how it goes i i want to work with somebody and so i'll i'll be like hey let's do this <laughs> and <laughs> you know and, and uh you made a reference to you know in business people uh you know sometimes you know, it can compromise who you are in business that sort of thing uh for the most part, you know, a game, the game industry is a business and it needs to be treated like a business. Of course, you know, you gotta, you know, it's how I support my family. Right. So I get it. But most working with most people in the game industry, they tend to be really honest, upfront people. You can, you know, you can do hand handshake deals and people, uh, are generally, you know, I've done handshake deals with a lot of guys. I've since gotten away from that in two things in writing, just because that's more professional, uh, now that it's, you know, my full time, my full time employment. But the you know gamers are just really good people, I guess is is what I was going to say. And you know, sure, there's an element out there that in any group that's that's not great. But by and large, man, I like ninety eight percent of gamers are awesome. I, I really am happy to be in this field. It's good people. Yeah, definitely. It, it gaming, you know, there's not too many. Um, I would say like art form slash businesses around where it has a very indie feel still. Um, uh, a lot of a lot of the uh, people that own different um, companies, Chaosium, Modifius, mm -hmm. and so forth, they're yeah. all still fans. Game, uh, Steve Jackson. Chris Birch from uh, Modifius, super nice guy. I met him yeah. when I was over at, at uh, UK Games Expo. What a wonderful guy. I had breakfast with, with him and, and one of his, uh, uh, Daniel, one of his uh, key workers, and, and my wife, and, and Grogu. Super nice. And, of course, Jeff Richard has become my friend through just going to Genghis Khan and game hole and uh, playing games and drinking beer with him. I didn't even know that him and, and, and Rick like base and Neil owned Chaosium. <laughs> so, but, but now I, I hang out with those guys. I've written some uh, Cthulhu adventures and uh, played RuneQuest. Great company, great people, 
I highly recommend uh, Chaos and what a just wonderful company and good people. Definitely. And um, go, going back to Okram, um, so mm -hmm. you've ran, well, probably you've ran the fifth edition version of this a few times at, oh, at your tons. conventions or yeah. other conventions. Mm -hmm. um, what's been some of the funny scenarios you've come across <laughs> running this? Oh, if I'm, sure. If I may ask. Yeah, oh, of course. So uh, I tend to run the first one more than the rest of them just because obviously I want to get people started on it and then say, hey, you can continue the adventure. So in the first one, in the fit five, uh, 5e version, you kind of, you know, Pelico says, hey, I need this. Can you help me out? People end up going to the Grand Library of Shintufi to research about the Oculus of Senrad Ba. And a character who I really thought was just, eh, you know, it's not going to be that, that interesting. Uh, it would just be like a, 30 second or, you know, five minute, you know, interaction, uh, the librarian diaphragm and the younger just through play, uh, that's become like one of my favorite characters. And he's just a librarian. He just appears in, in, in that, in that scene. Uh, but, uh, he's old, he's like 80 years old and he's diaphragm and the younger, which is kind of, which is funny, but I play him with like an ear horn and, and, and he was at the desk and, and, uh, you know, he'll be like, Hey, what is it? And then people will speak louder for him to hear. And he's like, Shh, this is a library. Was, you know, and he's, you know, you have to bribe him and he's cantankerous. And, and uh, you know, uh, I just have had so much fun role playing that character. Uh, that's just been a blast. And then um, through the adventure, uh, you end up uh, generally finding some magical items that are associated with uh, Azim, the god of, of the sea. Uh, in 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 the first adventure, and uh, one of the items is a sho shofar or horn that you can blow, uh, but it only works underwater, and it summons sharks. Uh, so it, it summons sharks, and I'm giving spoiler alert. I'm giving some things away. So if you're playing this, uh, you know, uh, but because uh, <laughs> I'm running this in a time constrained environment, right? I'm having to. It's probably an eight to 12 hour adventure, maybe 16, right? But I'm pushing people through and trying to get to the end, you know, so I have to slash some things out and maneuver around. But they get to the, the end where they're meeting the big bad guy, which is a big water elemental, right? You know, a gin or something, water gin. And uh, uh, they're fighting him and he's pretty tough. He's, he's pretty badass. Uh, and what a couple, two or three uh, people have done over the past couple of years and I've run it, many times at conventions all over the all over the world uh they take one of the characters dives into this giant watery creature right taking damage it's cold and also they take damage and i make them make some sort of check where they have to get over 20 on acrobatics or athletics or something just to be able to force themselves inside right and they're taking damage the whole time and then they blow the shofar and summon sharks from inside of this thing right and so we're usually close to the end of the time so I just call that the Sharknado move, and uh, I have the sharks do a Sharknado and and blow up, and they they uh, they defeat they defeat uh, uh, <laughs> the character whose name is Usapepasos, uh, and it's very very long. And why is it named? Uh, why is he named Usapepasos? It's because Matt Everhart knew I'd have to say it a lot of times in uh, game and wanted to make it very difficult for me to say Usapepasos, but I practiced enough that I can say it very easily. Hmm. It, not not to sidetrack too much, but yeah. if I may ask, what is I noticed you have a really good handle of naming characters. Mm -hmm. um, do, do you have a secret? I, that's probably what, what, the one thing I struggle with the most when there's a new NPC comes in and they're asking me who is this person's name, and I'm like, um, pen and paper, Smith. Oh, yeah, that's so that's a common thing, and 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 you know, it's tough for me too. So what I found is there's a few different ways that you can handle that. And depending on, on, on how you want to do it, if you have a device nearby, you can do a quick fantasy name generator or something like that. Or if you know that there's going to be a few things, pull up 10, you know, write 10 names on a piece of paper and then give them a little characteristic or something or like this person from work. Right. And then they'll just have those characteristics. Oh, they look like this and they kind of, you know, and you'll find yourself using some of the word selections that they use. Are they educated? Are they haughty? You know, uh, you know, they have ruddy skin. Is it pockmarked? Do they have a scar? Are they missing a digit? Right. Give them a little something that, that differentiates makes them memorable and then give them a, 
a pattern of speech, right? So there's several YouTubes you can listen to about character voices and stuff. I'm terrible at it, by the way, awful character voices. But if you just decide to make some pauses more when they're talking, right? That gives that, well, now you know you're in character. Or if like, uh, yeah, um, it's over here in this, um, I kind of talk kind of fast. I'm a little shifty and uh, I, lo I look nervous and, uh, you know, I like to fidget a lot. I've got, perhaps I have ADD, you know, whatever it is, right? So you give them a little something there and that's, and that's and that's good. Or you sit a little bit more straight when you're talking. And well, yes, uh, interestingly enough, or you know, whatever that may be, or stoop over. They're old, and you know, they're on a cane. And so those sorts of little things uh, uh, encourage your players to uh, interact in 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 that kind of same uh, manner if that's what they enjoy. And, and so that's 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 been helpful as far as naming people for i take some time when i name them in a written product i'll try to usually think of something that's kind of a you know evokes a thought or is a, a play on words or, or something so that's a little bit of fun for me too the the setting book you mentioned about uh earlier um that mm -hmm. you're working on for yeah. 2025 mm -hmm. um is that going to be system agnostic is it going to be shadow dark 5e oh man see you hit this question on the head i'm creating it kind of for 2014 5e right and now we got 2024 uh rules out there and i really haven't even barely looked at him right let's be honest I've, i haven't had a chance to, to digest that and see where it's going it's supposedly compatible i'm not sure uh, so yeah, I think that writing it for uh, writing the lore to be more story that is adaptable is probably wiser. And, uh, you know, we'll, may, I may keep it in 5e, 2014 5e, uh, you know, for the stat parts and perhaps offer maybe PDFs or something like that, or conversion to, um, you know, any CNC if people like CNC or or Shadow Dark or ca Castles and Crusades because uh, I also like Castles and Crusades that's a that's a great system too that uses uh, the siege engine mechanic uh, which I actually thought of prior to D and D where they have you know basic challenge ratings and and skills and you have to roll over the challenge challenge rating so that's you know that that mechanic uh, predated Five E in that game and my dad they basically the Troll Lords created. Uh, castles and crusades for my dad to write comfortable to write adventures comfortably in a system that he was familiar with so um that's where it came from and of course another project that i'll be working on is castle zagig uh coming up starting in 2025 we're going to continue those works um uh, uh, of my dad's original campaign in, in in castle and environs uh so that's being developed right now as well so totally separate but that'll be next year and i'll be working with the trolls on that one if I may ask a personal question, mm -hmm. sure. Looking at looking at your 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 father's works, the the last mm -hmm. some of the last things he worked on, mm -hmm. have you noticed a, a change of style compared to his earlier works? Yeah, uh, for sure. Uh, so D and D, my dad was a war gamer, right? He loved all sorts of games. Don't get me wrong; he liked board games, but pretty competitive, right? Everything was a, it was it was competitive. You know, war you're. There's winners and losers uh, for the most part. Now I thought of Dungeons and Dragons and that started this turn, which is very important. Cooperative play. Pretty, it's pretty awesome. You know, and, and just how that the skills it teaches you and how that kind of changes the interaction with people and, and brings you together. And I, I really like that. Um, but I think at first, a lot of his adventures were still DM players, right. And a little bit, a little bit of, of adversarial, in the early seventies, right. That changed as he progressed into, uh, you know, different systems. So he left D and D in 85, but of course you can see a, a change in the, in the styles, even in the, in the eighties. Right. But by the time he was working in like legendary adventures or other systems, uh, he was tired of writing your standard adventure too. Right. He's like, Oh geez, how many times am I going to write, you know, the similar kind of stories you're talking about? Okay. Yeah. You know, you go into a bar, the guy hires you to go there and all right, you rescue the, princess get the artifact etc uh so he wanted to start doing more <laughs> unfortunately because i don't like this stuff he loved to do haggling and shopping and that sort of stuff because i would have to play test his cities and environs and stuff. i'm like no i'm like let's just go do the adventure part and he's like no 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 you've got to go get the equipment you got to go prepare it's like oh no so that adventure would be haggling with the merchants and finding you know all the different personalities and stuff so so that all that sort of stuff became uh you know more more important 
figuring out the puzzles. You know, there was a lot of difficult, you know, or, or a lot of challenging puzzle bits where keen observation and 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 uh, looking around your areas. They, he always liked that, but that usually yielded you treasure back in the day. Oh, I searched these areas carefully and do this, and you'd find some hidden treasure, right? Uh, whereas I think in future adventures, you had to be keen on it, your environs to get clues on that would open up you know, other bits of the adventure. So, so I think it became more, um, a little bit more puzzle solving and, and investigation and RP as he continued, uh, you know, throughout that evolution. Now, of course, he could still open up his, you know, his old hand-drawn binder from, you know, 1974 and run you through an OD&D dungeon crawl. Uh, and that would be a lot of fun too. Uh, it's just different, it's just different styles of play. And if I can take an aside here, which is not associated with the uh, Wrath of the Sea Lich, which is a fantastic adventure, and I hope you back it. Uh, for the, I also run GaryCon, uh, which is a convention in honor, a memorial convention in honor of my father in Lake Geneva, where Dungeons and Dragons was written. It ha takes place in March, of every year and Gary Con 17 will be March 20th through 23rd. Uh, we still have a few badges available, but <clears throat> for this past March, it was the 50th. This is the 50th year anniversary year of Dungeons and Dragons. So I put together, well, I had an idea. I thought, what can I do to celebrate the 50th year of Dungeons and Dragons? And I came up with this concept. What if you could play the same character in the same adventure through all editions of D&D. How would that be? You would get to experience the play style differences as your character evolves, your style of play has to evolve to adapt to that. So how did the rules impact the style of play, right? What was possible? What was encouraged? What were, what were the, those nuances? And you'd get them right back to back, right? So it'd really be a great way to experience the evolution of D&D. And so I did that. I created, um, uh, I did it. I, I, I had a whole convention, <laughs> an extra convention before GaryCon to celebrate the 50th anniversary. And I called it Founders and Legends. And out of that, the Founders and Legends tournament, uh, I recruited Keith Baker, uh, Zeb Cook, Kelsey Dion, Mike Merles, and Andrew Perry to help me develop and DM uh, uh, this tournament. And so it ended up being four, four hour blocks or sessions right uh, over two days and it was completely immersive you start off as an od and d character and you played the you got your issued your character and your team you formed a team the night before here's your character eight in the morning you played a four-hour block of od and d you were handed your 1e 2e character to play after lunch you finished that four-hour block at supper time you got your third edition character you came back the next morning you played third edition somewhere in in the middle of that session you converted to fourth edition, something happened. So you went and got a new character sheet. Oh, you're now fourth edition. And then the last block was fifth edition. So you got to play that same character in the same storyline through all editions in a in a 16 hours of, of gaming over two days. It was amazing. People were, went nuts for it. And we're doing part two of that at, at GaryCon, the Founders and Legends tournament. Uh, and it's just nuts. So we, we got, it, it was amazing. So uh, <laughs> that was, that was fantastic. I can't even remember how I got this. I was just so excited to talk about the 50th <laughs> that, that thing. It was so cool. Uh, we had, we sold, I was going to do like three tables of eight. So I was going to do 24. That sold out in like less than a day. So I made eight more available. That sold out. And so I made one more available and that sold out quickly. And I was like, well, we like, we just don't have room to do more. So, so that was it. So 40 <laughs> people played it. And I think 35 people have signed up for it. Again, like 32 of the originals and three new ones. And I, I got, I think last time I looked, there was five badges, but I haven't looked in a, a week or two, to be honest with you. So uh, if you want to come and have that ultimate experience and play with some killer DMs and this amazing uh, style of play, you know, GaryCon.com, go ahead and take a look and you can get that. So uh, anyway, back to uh, back to what we were doing here with Wrath of the Sealage. Well, 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 when you say when you say part two, do you mean the yeah. same character from last year? Yeah, it's a continued character? adventure. Yeah, so this is inspired by my this. Oh, so we're talking about adventure design. This is inspired by uh, one of my dad's classic adventures. So I can give you the title. The first, the first Founders and Legends tournament 
adventure was called Ragnarok. So that should give you an idea of kind of what it's based off of, right? The second part is called Descent. So that may also be a hint if you're a fan of, of D&D and the history. So, um, uh, and of course, there's amazing, really interesting NPCs in there, uh, uh, new creatures uh, that I put in there. So part one, oh my God, I forgot what I called it. The Blitzenverm is what uh, the gnomes call it. It's a, a cross cross between a uh, white and a black a white and a blue dragon that i made for uh okram and i've of course thunder frost dragon there we go it's a thunder frost dragon so that's that is making an appearance there and then we're also in descent if any of you are out there this is uh, i'm giving you some great intel so uh they're they're gonna run into uh a, a, the spider people that inhabit uh the ever dark in in Okram, so the Sarakai. Uh, so that'll be that'll be really neat. So there's new creatures, there's you know new stuff, and there's there's a story arc that that we've developed out, and I think it's going to have a total of three parts. So um, we had Ragnarok Descent, and then part three uh, will kind of wrap up that that story arc. Uh, but these guys, it's it's they're it's an epic storyline. I, I sorry, I don't want I don't want to say more about it just because it is a comp it is a tournament and. Uh, if I spill any beans here and one team gets the word and the others don't, then I'll, I'll be in trouble for uh, tipping the hand. <laughs> They're very competitive. These guys are very competitive. They, most of them didn't know each other. Now each group like has like their own discords. They talk you know, like weekly and, and listen, they're like already planning how they're going to go about, uh, you know, this year's tournament and stuff. And they've named their teams. We just call them team A, B, C, and D. Now they all have team names and, and yeah, it's, it's amazing. So this is, this, this was great fun. Getting back to um, Raph the Sea Lich, is there anything else about this that I haven't mentioned about that you wanted to share? No, I think we, we've we've covered a lot of ground. I mean, I guess it just in in synopsis, you know, kind of a, a synopsis of this. It takes place in the city of Shintufi in my world of Okrim. There's enough information that that you can work with there to run it. It's also adaptable to to whatever campaign setting you're using for for your game. Honestly, I mean, I like Shadow Dark. And this is cool, but if you're running maybe a, another an OSE or something like that, it's going to be convert. It's going to convert pretty easily, right? Because it's Dungeon Delvey and that sort of stuff. Probably Dungeon Crawl Classics too, and some of these other games would be good. It's an old school. This is an old school style of play, and so the adventures around that. This is a big adventure. There's a lot going on. There's layers to this thing. It's going to be hard. Players are are are. Uh, this is grim dark, uh, so it's it's going to be a tough slog if you're not playing if you're not using your your wits it's going to be a lot harder uh and like i said there's layers of stuff going on there's other people involved who are looking for stuff and and trying to either you know trying to intervene in there there's a timeline if you uh delay things happen that aren't good right so players action or inaction will have consequences so i think it's a great adventure uh, that will entertain Gosh, I mean, it will ent entertain you and your your friends for several sessions. I think. I mean, ten would probably ten, ten would be pretty damn quick. I would say if you get through it in ten ten adventures, and you're probably gonna like I said, level up in Shadow Dark probably two times, which is a lot <laughs> for for mm -hmm. for Shadow Dark. You know, to go from up to fourth and then fifth level, or 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 fifth and then sixth level. That's that's pretty significant. Um, and cool magic items. I mean, it's. This is a good adventure. You you are going to you are it's a it's a great value, uh, in in something that will keep your players on their toes, bring them a lot of excitement, and hopefully keep them talking about your game for many many weeks and months to come. Thank you for being so generous and sharing with me uh, the, the inspirations behind this, and and of course all your other projects that you're working on. It's it's a, you're you're a very busy person, and I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us about about Raft the Sea Lich as well as yeah. other other things as well. Yeah, no, I appreciate you having me on and, and giving me a chance to uh, reach out and talk to people who may not know about the things that I'm doing, and we'll have a chance to look at look at Gary Khan and Gex works and, and, and follow me on social media. Uh, and if you do that, it's basically at Luke guy Gex. So there's pretty, I'm pretty easy to find. It's a, a unusual name. Uh, you can not only find out about gaming stuff, you can see uh, pictures of my beautiful family and my puppy dog Grogu. So uh, super bonus. I, I do follow you on social media and I've noticed that as well as you share a lot of stuff about gaming, you also mm -hmm. share about your, your workout stuff. Yeah. Um, for, now, I personally have been having trouble um, 
finding a good time to work out myself because it's uh, my schedule is always very hectic and i can imagine yours is very hectic as well yeah. um how do you how do you make the time to keep yourself fit well you know what i found that it it makes me feel better to go to the gym and work out, it makes me a little bit more productive. So for me, that's like a way to kind of relax. Um, I tend to go in the morning after my kids leave for school. Uh, then I just go to the gym. It's not too busy at that time. And I spend a little bit of time working out. A lot of times I'll, I'll answer like some quick emails or do some discussions on signal or something with, with people between sets, but it, it really helps clear my mind. And it, it, in what I look at it as, making time for myself. And so uh, I feel that that's important. Uh, our job uh, or our lifestyle, a lot of times in gaming tends to be more sedentary. And, you know, my father uh, was uh, uh, overweight, he smoked, he didn't exercise, and he ended up dying of uh, uh, aortic aneurysm, right? So abdominal aortic aneurysm. So cardiovascular uh, heart heart issue. Uh, my good friend, James Ward passed away very recently. He had diabetes and he talked about that uh, quite a bit. I know lots. I see lots of my other friends, uh, on that. I know, you know, I, I see them posting on social media from the hospital with, you know, cardiac issues, atrial fibrillation and, and other things like that. And I just thought, well, you know what? Um, I, when I retired, I found I had a little bit more time to work out in a little bit less stress. I wasn't working full time and running Gary Con and writing. So I'd kind of downsized to two jobs. And so I had a little bit more time and people asked me, what are you doing to stay fit? And I'm not a trainer. I, I, I don't, I'm not a you know medical, uh, you know, I don't want to dispense medical advice or anything like that. So I just said, you know what? You pick your goal. What are you looking to do? Uh, and I just want to encourage you to pick that goal, whether it's walking a mile or, you know, bench pressing 315 pounds, whatever your goal is, pick, three days a week, 30 minutes, do it, and then post about it in a little Facebook group that I started. It's called the Body by Gygax Challenge. I thought that was funny, Body by Gygax, because gamers, right? And I think there's over 500 people now in there, in there working on it. And my buddy, Tommy Rice, and I are working uh, slowly, <laughs> much too slowly, but we're working towards uh, a fitness app that would help gamify fitness so that uh, gamers will have more reason, more incentive, more to, to remember, oh, I need to do my exercise, whether that's at the gym, whether it's on a bike, whether it's in your garage, whether it's walking, whatever it is that you're going to do with your group, with your party, so that you can, you can, uh, you know, overcome and, and, and get the rewards, that sort of thing. Why? Well, I just find it relaxing for me, but I want to post about it, not because I have an ego or anything like that. It's more because I want to encourage others to get out and be active because I want to see lots of my friends at the gaming table at conventions all over the place for decades to come. And I don't want to lose uh, any more of my friends prematurely to preventable, uh, you know, diseases and, and stuff like that. So that's, that's really my motivation behind talking about fitness and posting about fitness. Hmm. And I think that's a great note to end this interview on. Um, um, uh, viewers, um, I will put links in the description below for the Kickstarter, the, the Patreon and the uh, Gaxworks website, in case you want to know more about Wrath the Sea Lich, uh, definitely check this out. It, it's it it is um it's hard to explain this without giving too much away, but there is so many layers of of storytelling in this adventure in the Ocarim world. It's just really amazing. Um, I can't wait for that setting book for twenty twenty five. That's I'm going to be first in line to All grab right. it. Um, but uh, yes, everyone, um, thank you for watching or listening. Uh, take care out there. We'll see you next time.